because you have to think about it. You most of us only you only get one PhD. I, I hope so. I mean, I, I'm not gonna get a second one. Maybe some people get several masters. But what I'm saying is that it's it's your degree. It's your name that is going to be written on that thesis, and it's something that you will live the rest of your life, your professional life, based on that. So you have to at some point you have to make that decision whether. Um, you want to you want to continue uh, to to work on something that you're not as interested in, as uh, passionate about, or you want to uh, try and put the effort to to make that change. And like I said, everything has to start from you. You can always uh, you point out that sometimes you may you may be in an engineering field, but you're interested in, in psychology. There are a hundred ways that you can do a thesis in engineering with a focus or a research on, on psychology. Um, you may not think that's the, like two of the things that are like the most contrast. Um, so in any field, if you have interest or if you're not happy with your research, think about ways um, to to amend your uh, proposal, to change, to explore new new avenues. And I always talk to a professor. It always has to start with you. We talked about being prepared. So you have to do the research. You have to be. You have to have a good idea and plan when you. It's like sending an idea to someone. So if you go to a to professor and you're like, I, I don't like my research, but I have no idea what I want to do, and I, it's, you're not getting anywhere. But you need to know, first of all, what you're not happy with, and why is that. And then think about your other interests and where you want your research to go, and then kind of talk with your advisor together um, on changing, as, and making changes, and, and kind of gearing your, your, your research and your efforts towards as close as possible to your to your interest. If that doesn't work, and if you um, do everything in your power, then you may consider switching labs. Um, that's pretty much what I what I what I um, wanted to to mention. That do not think that if you don't like your research, if you're not happy, it means you have it's time to switch labs. There are a ton of things that can be done, and professors are are, are always willing and open to that um, and are understanding. And have a good understanding of, of, of the students' needs and, and differences with respect to their interests. So, do you open that? I would say that switching labs involves a lot of thinking, okay, about your reasons for doing this. And it really is a situation kind of thing. For example, if a professor has been supporting you for two years on a specific research grant that needs deliverables, you're part of that deliverable, then you have to seriously think whether or not your contribution to that is important enough to stick with it uh, to your PhD, or whether that's a point that you could switch to another lab without um, seriously impacting the deliverables from the project that you've been committed to for two years. Okay, so after two years, I would say it's not really possible to switch it. If it doesn't happen in the first year and a half or so, I think that you've just got to stick with that project and finish it to the best of your ability. But um, otherwise, you have to think about broader issues than just your own interests when you make such a, such a decision. And you'll find that that's true throughout your career as well. I mean, as you're, you know, working on certain projects, whatever you're doing in academia or in industry or in government or whatever, there are certain projects that you just have to finish. You're committed to them. A lot has been invested in that, and it has to, has to come to some sort of completion. So at the point that you're thinking about switching a, a lab, you have got to have talked very, very candidly with the people involved with this decision so that you don't leave any borough bridges behind you. You want to make sure you don't do that. It's also easier to switch a lab within the same department program than going to a new program. We've had students try to do that, and then we'll do some requirements and canvases and classes. So within the program, even if you can find an advisor that's maybe in a different department, but is an adjunct can act as an advisor for your program, that can sometimes help. Just as long as staying within the program once you've committed to it. So I've seen this work, well, I've seen this work extremely poorly. And I think one of the things Dr. Kilom mentioned is, is incredibly important. Um, not every topic that you might be interested in is something that your the faculty member you're working with is actually financially supported to do. So they may not have the flexibility to just 
study, you know, end topic. And so being respectful and understanding what you're asking is a really important part of this. And in general, you know, being respectful <coughs> and how you handle this is important. So I've seen a student basically go to a faculty member and say, I don't really like the research you're doing. I'm more interested in this. Obviously, that fell flat, and it went extremely poorly. The student burned a lot of bridges, um, not only with that person, but with people that that person that were in that person's network. Um, and I've seen it go well, where it's more of a mutual thing, where the faculty member and the student sort of see together that the student has distinct interests, and the faculty member sort of supports the students in finding either a co-mentor or um, a new mentor. Um, and so, you know, you just really have to proceed carefully and cautiously if this happens, especially if the person, um, you basically committed to doing a particular project and that person has been supporting you to do that project for some period of time because that could be a really big um, problem for that person if you leave. It doesn't mean you don't do it, it just means you have to really be careful in thinking about how you do it and how you go about it. It's always, you know, you want to support someone's burning interest, you do. And she mentioned, um, Jennifer mentioned co-mentors, and, and I've gone that route several times with students. Who, who had a burning desire to go in that direction, which I didn't. But I had a colleague who did. And so we became co-mentors, so that student actually finished uh, well the piece that they were working with me on and was able to explore a new direction as well, both pieces of which ended up in their dissertation. That works. You just have to be very open and honest about this with everyone involved in this. And generally, people support people's burning interests if they can. I believe it or not, actually, a secret in the trade is very small portion of students often knock at the door of professors to talk to them. That's true. So uh, if you happen to be those few percent of students want to talk to a professor, you're actually on the professor's very good list. <laughs> so don't be shy, just knock at the professor's door, just ask what is a good time for me to come to uh, talk with you a little bit about this or that. Give some topics so the professor know the scope of the discussion. He, would, he or she would tell you some slots of time, find a mutually agreeable time and talk to them. And do this often and then you separate yourself from the large portion of students who never go to talk to him or her. And this will give you a lot more opportunity to get in mentorship and help. Okay. Are there any questions? I have a question which I think is appropriate for this forum. Okay. And I know it hasn't been touched upon, but maybe subsumed under, under the answers that we've given. And does gender ethnicity and cultural differences play any role at all in deciding whether a student is going to be successful or not in graduate school? In graduate school, I think there's one very, very important ingredient to determine whether the student is successful or not, two ingredients. Number one is ability, number two is tenacity, one to succeed, these two things. If a student has basic ability, good in math and good in physics, good in, they have much more opportunity to be successful. Then there are two kinds of people. One is like a dog. He wants to buy something, he will not let go until he get what he wants or she wants. That kind of people tends to be successful in getting the PhD dissertation complete. Uh, ability and tenacity and want to fix. There may be many other ingredients, but these two I observe is, uh, is important. I mean, I think, go ahead. No, go ahead. I think gender just matters. It does. Um, it matters um, for really silly reasons, like you may have an advisor who's just is a male and he's awkward with females, or you know that sort of thing. But it also matters because for most women, you're you're 
going to grad school during your childbearing years and you have to make those decisions and there's politics of when you have kids and if you do that before the market or after the market, it, it matters. Um, it should matter in terms of whether you're a good scientist, whether you do good work, whether your publications are great, whether you succeed, but it, it will shape your graduate school experience. We'd all like to think that it doesn't happen, but it does. And, and gender is important. And, and I could spend hours and hours telling you of examples of that that I personally experienced. Um, I won't, but you can come see me if you're interested. <laughs> But, uh, but it does matter, and, and if you're, uh, particularly if you're a woman, there are other women faculty members, and I would encourage you to get one of them as a mentor, that you can discuss these more subtle uh, problems that arise. Uh, and, and my own colleagues in, in my department often come to me and say, my male colleagues tell me, I, I just, we're going to a meeting, I just don't know how to tell my female graduate student how to dress for this meeting. I just don't feel comfortable with telling her how important it is to dress professionally at a professional meeting. Could you maybe, you know, find some time to talk to her? Those are the kinds of things that, you know, come up and they're, um, they are important. Uh, when you have field programs too, when you go out to the field to primitive locations with a mixed bag of people, then gender can enter in often to that experience and uh, those kinds of things come up. So as a woman faculty member, I have mentored a lot of women uh, students and other faculty women actually about how to deal with these problems as they arise. All right, anybody else? Does anybody have any comments to add? I will just say that ethnicity seems to me not to matter so much. I mean, I'm happy to say that, but I really think that that's the case. There have been a few times when I, I had a colleague who, when, when CSET broke up, where they sent the faculty to departments and he was an engineer, I got sent to an engineering department, and his first meeting with the dean of engineering, now I'm not here, so I can say this, told him, uh, You're, I'm not going to allow you to have any more Chinese graduate students in your lab. You have to have American students. I mean, what's that about? You know, that's just crazy. crazy. He said that to another faculty. Did he? Oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's All right. It's I mean, I just it's thought it's that was outrageous. And, uh, you know, those kinds of things happen. But, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to add that uh, what was mentioning is actually very important realities. Um, as I mentioned earlier, at this point, in this country, we have a huge need for young people go into science and technology. So if you have some interest for the graduate school of science and engineering and technology, you are actually the people that our quote unquote society or industry are seeking. So you are you are actually a commodity that is in need. So the graduate school is not that difficult. And there are many scholarships and uh, fellowship and foundations have opportunities to assist you. So by all means in time. Number two, if you happen to be one gender, for example, the female gender, and there are even more opportunities for you in the sense that I sit on many faculty search committees of our, our department and other departments. We are looking everywhere for equally capable female faculty and they will have priority that we want to, to hire. And many times we don't have enough applicants. So actually the opportunity is wide open to you. Uh, you do need to make some decisions. For example, we have some colleagues once they are in our faculty and they actually <coughs> have a time to decide when to have a child or delay not to have a child. Those are very important decisions, but those decisions need to be made. But there are many people who make them and, and could be very, very successful. When I was a graduate student, I saw a very successful female professor and, he, and she recently 
announced that she may be slowing down, and her last name is Dresselhaus. She has been a very, very successful professor, female, and if you think about 30, 35 years ago, uh, the career uh, is even more gender, gender skilled. It has been improved. But it is very, very doable, and give it a try, make decision by the time you have to make decision. Don't be stopped by, oh, there are so many obstacles. Obstacles, many times when you face them face by face, they turn out, turn out to be shadows. And uh, just give it a try. I think the question was very, um, it could be thought about in so many different ways. And I think if we think about admissions into programs or when somebody is hiring a student, I don't know that those things come into question um, for most people. But when we think about um, action mentoring um, or being the person that's being mentored, I think that's when it does matter. And I think that there can be places where race and ethnicity does matter in terms of the student's perspective um, coming potentially into a department where they maybe don't see anyone of their race or ethnicity in that department. And that can be a challenge for people. Um, and, and the same with gender and, and so on. So, you know, it's kind of a question that has multiple layers to it. And if the question is really, you know, do you think you won't get accepted into a lab because of your gender, or your race, your ethnicity, I would say that that's probably pretty rare. But the issues come more when you're being mentored. So, um, Sue mentioned, you know, sometimes there are issues with gender um, and mentoring. There are some great male mentors for female graduate students, but there are these issues. I've been asked to talk to women who cry um, because the men don't want to talk, raise that issue with the students. Um, and so, you know, there can be those issues. Um, and you can, if you have a, a mentor that is a particular gender that's different from yours or an ethnicity or race that's different from yours, you may want to seek out mentors that have that in addition that have similar issues to you to talk about those kinds of things to help you navigate the waters if you do develop issues that are specific to your gender or your race or your ethnicity. Okay. Well, I think um, at this point we're going to wrap up the panel. Um, so thank you to everybody who attended and a special thank you to all of our panelists. Um, and then, so I guess if, um, as we're wrapping up, if you guys have any other questions and you want to, you know, approach a panelist and they're about to stay after for a few minutes to ask them a specific question, feel free. Otherwise, thank you all for coming.